Thanks, Tolotoma. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, it's not raining yet, which is good, so you guys don't have to be soaked while you sit here. Uh, I guess uh, let me just say one before I get going. Just one quick word about how this uh, this paper came about. It, it it's part of a project I'm working on that. Uh, it may be a book, it may not. I don't really, I really don't know how far it's going to go or how much it's going to get fleshed out. But um, the way it arose was, um, you all may know that in, if you've read Before the Law that uh, I take up Roberto Esposito's work in some detail in that book and, and express, uh, I try to express a balance actually of, of what I think is interesting and promising about his work, but also some of my reservations about where he ends up, especially in the book Bios which, as you all may know, was published in the Post-Humanity series at Minnesota that I edit. <coughs> and so uh, I was actually teaching a graduate seminar on biopolitical thought. Uh, and uh, I, the way this paper came up or came about was that um, he, he and I were going to actually give kind of side-by-side -side talks at this conference, in, uh, which we did in Torino in Italy last summer. And uh, as I was uh, teaching the graduate seminar, I actually went back to his book, uh, Immunitas, which is one of the three volumes, Immunitas, Communitas, and Bios, in that, in that large work of his. Um, and I also went back and, and started cross-reading cross his description of the, the immunitary mechanism, because as you all know, that's the stick that he, the stick that he uses to beat Foucault with, is that Foucault doesn't really understand that the immunitary mechanism is, is central to biopolitical thought. So I started going back and kind of um, cross-referencing the architecture of the immunitary mechanism in Esposito's reading with what would be the kind of systems theoretical equivalence, you might say, terminologically, but also conceptually and theoretically in, in the theory of autopoiesis. And what I discovered really is that I think you, you have to end up in a place that's very different from where Esposito ends up. And, my, and, and I'm going to kind of describe in the paper what that place looks like. Uh, <coughs> I think that Esposito finally, uh, to me, is a thinker who ends up being uh, really pulled in two opposite directions. I think, I think half of Esposito um, kind of wants to be a Gombin, and half of Esposito kind of wants to be Derrida, and he can't figure out how to sort of, sort of navigate uh, those two, um, I think they're actually desires in a way for him. Um, and so I think he ends up being stretched uncomfortably and I think finally sort of um, um, incoherently, I guess, in a way, across those two conflicting desires. And so, so that's kind of what, what the paper comes out of. And we'll see whether it <coughs> turns into a book or it turns into something shorter. We'll worry about that later. Um, so I think that's all I need by way of preamble. So let me begin by noting <coughs> that there's a lot of interest recently, as you all probably know, in what Esposito calls the possibility of thinking what he calls an affirmative biopolitics that runs counter to the dominant trend in biopolitical thought thus far, thanks in no, no small part to the work of Agamben, namely the thanato-political caste that seems inevitable when we confront the increasing imbrication of life as a direct object of political power. Esposito's key intervention, as you all know, is to insist that the secret to understanding modern biopolitical formations is realizing that their fundamental logic is one of immunity, thus extending an observation that Foucault had already made in his lectures at the Collège de France, but had not really developed. <coughs> what I want to do in this talk is to use the immunological paradigm as a jumping off point to see what new resources for political thought reveal themselves when we return to the isomorphism, if it is one, between the immunological paradigm and the theory of autopoetic systems handed down to us from second order systems theory, which will, I think, open up new lines of connection between the immunological paradigm, systems theory, deconstruction, and pragmatism, and in particular the way social systems theory may be used to extend and refine the work of Foucault himself on biopolitics. So one way you can think about what I'm doing here and what I was trying to do in Before the Law is actually to use Lumen's work to radicalize Foucault. That's one way to think about it. <coughs> I think what we'll find is that when we explore these connections more deeply, they open up avenues to think anew a few different important questions that Esposito's work has drawn our attention to, including but not limited to the relationship between community and melancholy, guilt and lack, 
which remains within an ambit that thinks the political in an essentially tragic versus comic vein, and I'll come back to those terms later. And the central question that both Esposito and Derrida quite brilliantly raise, namely, as Esposito puts it, that, the, that autoimmunity expresses, quote, the logic of the immune system in its pure state, so to speak, unquote. So that it's not so much pathological as, quote, non-pathological or normally pathological, as he puts it. That what needs explaining, in other words, and I'm quoting again, is not the fact that in some cases the immune system attacks its own parts, but the fact that this normally does not happen, unquote. <coughs> A crucial problem for politics that, that we'll want to address then is the problem of controlling autoimmunity. Where this control comes from and what its logic is will lead us on a brief detour through Deleuze's suggestive late remarks on control society, again re-articulated here through the apparatus of systems theory, the better to show how what we might call a restricted or indeed weak sense of the political of the sort that we find in Lumen's work, thus has a more complex and fruitful relationship to an understanding of biopolitics focused not on the problem of sovereignty, as in Agamben or Schmidt, but on material dispositifs and apparatuses, one that constitutes a much, a much more complex dynamics of political effectivity in an increasingly heterogeneous field of biopolitical actors and agents, not all of them human, of course. <coughs> As Posito takes up the immunitary paradigm in many places in his work, not surprisingly in the most detail in his book Immunitas, and he argues that Foucault never really fully develops the immunitary logic of the biopolitical that he identifies in his later work. Foucault recognizes in his lectures from 1976 that, quote, the very fact that you let more die will allow you to live more, unquote, but he's unable to see that the affirmative and thanatological dimensions of biopolitics, either a politics of life or a politics over life, as Esposito puts it, are joined in a single mechanism. <coughs> For his part, Esposito insists that a turn away from the thanatological logic of biopolitics and toward an affirmative biopolitics can take place only if life as such, not, not just human versus animal life, not just Aryan versus Jewish life, not just Christian versus Islamic life, becomes the subject of immunitary protection. And this is so, he argues, because, quote, there's never a moment in which the individual can be enclosed in himself or be blocked in a closed system and so removed from the movement that binds him to his own biological matrix, unquote. Pretty commonsensical claim, I think, when you think about it. And this leads, in turn, <coughs> to Esposito's retrofitting of Spinoza's concept of natural right to make, quote, the norm the principle of unlimited equivalence for every single form of life, unquote. The general idea here is that this new norm will operate as a sort of homeostatic mechanism balancing the creative flourishing of various forms of life. As Esposito puts it, quote, the juridical order as a whole is the product of this plurality of norms and provisional result of their mutual equilibrium, unquote. Now, while I share Esposito's interest <coughs> in framing the possibility of an affirmative biopolitics, I also share Eugene Thacker's observation in his book After Life that if all forms of life are taken to be equal, then it can only be because they, as the living, e all equally embody and express a positive substantive principle of life, capital L, not contained in any one of them. The problem, he argues, and I'm quoting now, is that once one considers something like life in itself, whether in the form of a life principle or some other, or some other inaccessible first principle, then one must also effectively dissociate life, capital L, from the living. So I want to come at this question of an affirmative biopolitics and the relations between life and the living and the political by coming at it from a different direction, <coughs> from the inside out, you might say, rather than the outside in. As I mentioned earlier, Esposito engages systems theory directly in several places. In terms of the political, for example, he writes that Lumen's work, quote, constitutes the most refined articulation of immunitary logic as a specific form of modernization which he summarizes along the following lines. And this is a kind of a long quote from Esposito. He writes, the problem <coughs> of systematically controlling dangerous environmental conflicts is resolved not only through a simple reduction of environmental complexity, but instead through its transformation from exterior complexity 
to a complexity that, that is internal to the system itself. To this first strategy of interiorization, however, which is activated by an immunitary process, a second is added which is much more laden with consequences for environmental difference, namely its complete inclusion within the system or its objective elimination, and that's a claim that I'm going to take issue with. This development in Lumen's thought, he continues, which occurs when he adopts the biological concept of autopoiesis, shifts the lens from the defensive level of the systemic government of the environment to an internal self-regulation of systems that is completely independent and autonomous, again, I think a claim that's overreached, with regard to environmental pressures, unquote. <coughs> now, I think that a better analogy for the systems theory logic of immunity is actually one that Esposito has used elsewhere, namely the logic of Derrida's pharmacon, which is, quote, opposed to its other, not by excluding it, but on the contrary, by incorporating and vicariously substituting it, unquote. Let me explain this analogy in a little bit more detail. <coughs> the equivalent of the immunitary pharmacon is the autopoietic system that uses its own self-reference to process overwhelming environmental complexity. So that, as Lumen often puts it, when the distinction between system and environment is re-entered within the system's own self-referential code, the difference, as in Derrida's pharmacon, is both the same and not the same, as he puts it. Moreover, any system must remain blind to this paradoxical fact of its own self-reference if it wants to continue to use that code to process and reduce environmental complexity. The legal system, for example, could hardly admit that both sides of the distinction legal-illegal are in fact a, a self-produced product of only one side of the distinction, namely the legal. It could hardly admit, that is, that the system is founded on the tautology, legal is legal because that would collapse the, 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 the distinction on which its operations depend. It's not, <coughs> it's not that people in the legal system don't know this. It's that they must suspend this knowledge if they want the legal system to function. Otherwise, there would be no ground, however ex, ex nihilo and suspended over a void, as Zizek might say, for distinguishing the legal from the illegal. We, or they, as second order observers, can disclose this paradox, but for only from the vantage of another system using another code, which is in turn bound by the same formal logic that governs all autopoetic social systems. <coughs> Hence, in these terms, the outside, quote unquote, the environment is always the outside of a particular inside, a fact that is perhaps easier to grasp in biological and evolutionary work on the autopoiesis of perception and consciousness reaching back <coughs> to Jakob von Uxkel's work on human and animal umwelten and forward to philosophers of mind such as Alvin Noe, who reminds us that, quote, it's not the case that all animals have a common external environment because to each different form of animal life there is a distinct corresponding ecological domain or habitat, meaning, as he puts it, that all animals live in structured worlds. So the famous included exclusion of biopolitical thought <coughs> as the very figure of sovereignty, qua state of exception, as both constituted and constituting violence, as immunity qua indemnity, as Derrida puts it, and so on, are a product of the re-entry of the system environment distinction within the system's own self-reference. Let me stress two important points <coughs> that follow from this in closing out this really quick crash course in systems theory. First, this means as Esposito puts it, that for autopoietic immune systems, the task is not to protect the body from conflicts, but rather through conflicts. Indeed, to look forward to the material and control society a bit later in this talk, to use conflict in the system to manage and respond to, in a non-representational way, and that's very important, conflict in the environment. Second, this means that the immunitary relation between system and environment always operates on the basis of a radical complexity differential between the environment and any particular system, which is indeed the driver for the system's use of self-referential selection as a way to reduce, dampen, and slow down the ongoing flood of environmental complexity that threatens at every single moment to overwhelm it. <coughs> or as Lumen puts it, quote, the system's inferiority and complexity must be counterbalanced by strategies of selection, unquote since it's obviously impossible for any system to establish point-for-point -point correspondences in real time between its internal elements and every moment-to-moment -moment change 
going on in the entire universe of its environment. I stress this last point <coughs> to emphasize the fact, excuse me, <coughs> to emphasize the fact the systems theory is anything but a form of solipsism, or what Graham Harmon and other object oriented ontologists call in a more Kantian register correlationism, a charge familiar at least since Habermas's famous essay on Lumen in 1990 in the Philosophical Discourse of Modernity. As both Lumen and Maturana make clear, the veracity of the system's theoretical analysis is not about epistemological adequation to some pre-given state of ontological affairs, whether that's, whether that's conceived in either realist or idealist terms, but is pragmatic. <coughs> that is to say, it's based on its functional specificity. Contrary to the understanding of autopoetic systems as solipsistic, the operational closure of systems and the self-reference based upon it arise as a practical and adaptive necessity precisely because systems are not closed. That is to say, precisely because they find themselves in an environment of overwhelmingly and exponentially greater complexity than is possible for any single system. This is why they have to operate selectively or blindly, as Lumen puts it. Indeed, <coughs> the second order turn, or what I call the second order turn, as I've argued elsewhere, namely what is posthumanism, is to realize that the more systems build up their own internal complexity through recursive self-reference and closure, the more linked they are to changes in their environments to which they become more and more sensitive, which is why a bat or a dolphin or the legal system can register a higher degree of environmental complexity than an amoeba that responds only to either gradients of light or dark, higher or lower sugar concentrations, and so on, even, even though both are autopoetic systems. <coughs> or as Lumen puts it, in one of his more zen-like moments, only complexity can reduce complexity. What this means, and this has been a key insight since the first order systems theory of people like Gregory Bateson, is that the consequences of a particular event or utterance or act depend less on their semantic or informatic formal characteristics than on the dynamic state of the self-referential system itself and one might think here very readily of the case of the arrest and trial of Steve Kurtz of Critical Art Ensemble. Or as Lumen puts it <coughs> in Social Systems, quote, one can think this rose is a rose is a rose, but this use of a recursive path is productive only if it makes itself dependent on specific conditions and does not always ensue. Accordingly, he continues, a piece of information that is repeated is no longer information. It retains its meaning in the repetition but loses its value as information. One reads in the paper <coughs> that the Deutschmark has risen in value. If one reads this a second time in another paper, this activity no longer has value as information and no longer changes the dynamic state of the system, although structurally it represents the same selection." Unquote. <coughs> what all the foregoing draws our attention to is the intensely non-generic and transversal, to use Deleuze's term, uh, character of the bio of biopolitics in its Foucauldian articulation, how it's essentially a strategic problem and an object for the political, one that's conjugated and reconjugated anew under very, very specific coordinates and conditions, which may be ontological in the specific sense of the forms of embodiment and articulation with the environment, or sociological and historical, or all three at once, and of course, a whole lot more. This is why, <coughs> as Hans Georg Muller points out, Habermas was in fact right when he called Lumen systems theory metabiological because, quote, it follows evolutionary biology in denying transcendental agency and free will because, by definition, an ecosystem has no center. Evolution does not follow any guidelines or directives given by any of its subsystems, unquote. And in turn, he concludes, quoting again, <coughs> the partial blindness that comes with evolution also implies a certain ethical and pragmatic blindness. Since it's impossible to see everything, it's also impossible to see what is good for all, unquote. A point I'll come back to at the end of my remarks. Of course, <coughs> if everything we've just said is true of social systems in the context of modernity understood as a process of functional differentiation into horizontally distributed, non-hierarchical social systems, then it's also true by definition of the political system. In this light, we might well view this fact, and Lumen's theory generally, 
as a description of, of what Deleuze in his late remarks calls control society, not least of all because for Lumen, as we know, the constitutive elements of social systems are not persons or individuals, but communications, a, a central feature of control society that, that Deleuze borrows, as you may know, from none other than William S. Burroughs. Indeed, for Deleuze, <coughs> writing on the heels of his book on Foucault, what characterizes societies of control is their shift from what he calls analog to digital forms of communication that are smooth and continuous across what were, in disciplinary societies, qualitatively different social sites. As Greg, Flax as Greg Flaxman puts it, quote, far from concentrating power in a sovereign or consolidating it in social institutions, control corresponds to the vast dissemination of power in spaces that seem increasingly smooth and supple where modern disciplinary societies aggregated individuals in so many analogical sites, the factory is a prison, the school is a prison, and so on, control societies develop inseparable variations, as Deleuze puts it, forming a system of varying geometry whose language is digital, unquote. <coughs> if, we understand, if we understand digital here to mean a logic that is discrete and non-representational, but at the same time formally isomorphic across the various social systems, not powered from behind by real magnitudes, as Bateson puts it, then the usefulness of the Lumanian architecture comes readily into view. In control society, <coughs> the person or the individual, a semantics that both Lumen and Esposito, along with Foucault and Derrida, reject, is not constituted, as Greg Lambert puts it, by, quote, analogical breaks, or points of intense and subjective discontinuity between social institutions, unquote, as is the case right up through Althusser's work on in interpolation in ideological state apparatuses, but rather, as he puts it, undergoes <coughs> a peculiar process of continuous modulations like a snake shedding his coils, to use Deleuze's enigmatic phrase. Rather than being confined, Lambert continues, in disciplinary spaces and their protocols of enclosure and regimentation, Subjects in societies of control move fluidly from one site to the next. Instead of initiations in the guild, we have telecommuting, distance learning, online defensive driving courses. This is the sense in which control liberates. As Thacker and Alexander Galloway characterize it, <coughs> quoting them now, if the body in disciplinary societies is predominantly anatomical and physiological, in control societies, bodies are consonant with more distributed modes of individuation that enable their infinite, infinite variation. Informatic records, databases, consumer profiles, genetic codes, identity shopping, workplace biometrics, and the like. Express yourself. Output some data, they write. This is precisely how distributed control functions best. <coughs> now, Lumen's theory of what he calls the exclusion of the concrete individual and social systems gives us an especially incisive account of this logic. As Dietrich Schwanitz characterizes it, summarizing Lumen's theory, quote, the, hum the individual human being belongs to each of these functionally differentiated social subsystems for only short periods of time with only limited aspects of his person depending on his respective role as voter, pupil, reader, patient, or litigant. It is his fundamental exclusion from society that allows the occasional re-entry of the individual under particular circumstances. Modern society develops a semantics of individuality that regards the individual as alien, unfamiliar, unpredictable, and free." Unquote. <coughs> Esposito is indeed right, then, that therefore for Lumen, Quote, with respect to the system, one is therefore included by exclusion and excluded by inclusion, and that in these terms, as he puts it, community is immunity, unquote. Here, here however, <coughs> we have to remember the metabiological and ecological aspect of systems theory, and in particular, its acentric character and its exponential difference between environmental complexity and systemic closure and autopoiesis. From this vantage, what we might call the control of control comes from the outside, understood as the overdetermined complexity differential in favor of the environment versus the system. Indeed, as Lambert notes, in societies of control, unlike disciplinary societies, resistance, quote, does not begin from a site internal 
specific to, to a specific power relation that can become collectivized in the general image of a mythical humanity that suffers from too much oppression, as in, for example, the, the paradigm of the factory strike. Rather, <coughs> resistance, in Foucault's sense, has to be rearticulated as the control of control, as I'm putting it, that comes not from an intentional subject engaged in a representational act of defiance, the intentional exercise of freedom, which is one of the mechanisms by which control society operates, after all, and not from life, capital L, but rather from the weakness of the political system itself vis-a-vis -vis the overwhelming complexity <coughs> of its environment and the autonomy of the other social instances which undermines the ability of the political system, or any system, to unilaterally determine what life is, what the bio of biopolitics is, and so on. And so if, with Foucault, resistance comes first and is on the side of life, as he puts it, this is simply because environmental complexity, noise, as Bateson long ago put it, is the only source of new patterns, new information, and for Foucault, what he calls new schemas of politicization. And this is, <coughs> I'll just add one thing. This is one of the reasons I think that Foucault in the lectures realizes, he says, you know, I'm going to write um, the next stage in the, in the lectures, I'm going to do this thing on biopolitics. And he ends up basically writing a book on liberalism and neoliberalism and governmentality because I think he, he kind of realized that you've got to deal with the specific modes of appearance and production and articulation of, of what we call life or the living before you can move on to actually do the biopolitical project. <coughs> so, coming back, a more concrete example of how this works is offered by Levi Bryant's attempt to draw out some of the political implications of Lumen's work by cross-mapping it with some of the terms drawn from Badiou and others. Uh, in fact, Bryant begins with a distinction taken from the lexicon of these other thinkers that Lumen himself would reject, but is no nevertheless, I think, useful in this context when he writes that, quote, much of what we often call politics is governance rather than politics. Governance consists of the manner in which a larger scale object, or system in the terms I'm using, strives to maintain its structure or organization in its adventure across space and time by domesticating and regulating the elements of which it's composed. Politics, by contrast, still quoting, challenges the manner in which the larger scale object counts or fails to count other objects challenges the status of those objects that animate it as elements, instead announcing themselves as parts, and sets about either severing relations to this larger scale object, demolishing this relation, or reconfiguring it." Unquote. Bryant then <coughs> retrofits Badu's distinction between element and part to Lumen's account to draw out the relationship between system and environment in the process of what Foucault calls politicization. Quoting again, an element or a member of a set, he writes, exists only for the system in question and is defined relationally such that its being consists only in its relations to other elements in the system. The parts of a system, by contrast, are those other systems out of which a system constitutes its elements, are autonomous entities in their own right, and are always in excess of the elements that compose a larger scale system." Unquote. For example, <coughs> the elements professor and student do not exist outside the educational system that confers upon them their status and role in the system, but they are nonetheless constituted from other objects and systems, such as the psychobiological materiality of the creatures in question, or even for that matter, their roles as elements in other systems, say the economic system, which role might, for example, present or otherwise affect their ability to serve as elements in the educational system, and so on. Or to take another example <coughs> offered by Bryant, uh, one that has particular resonance for where I live on the border between the United States and Mexico, quote, illegal immigrants are part of the U.S. social system but are not counted as elements of the system, unquote. And they might be even more precisely included as elements in the economic system as wage earners and consumers, but excluded from the political system as voters and rights holders. Mathematically, he reminds us, and this sounds as, as if it could have come straight out of the pages of Lumen's social systems, quote, there are more possible relations among parts of a system than, there are, than are admitted by the organization and elements of a system, unquote. Or, <coughs> to put it in Lumanian terms, the environment is always already exponentially more complex 
locked in any particular system, and it's precisely because systems surrender a representational relationship to this fact that they can achieve a measure of durability. For Bryant, then, the political quote takes place when a part of an object rises up within another object and consists its status as a mere element of that object, unquote. Politics, he concludes, quoting again, <coughs> thus marks the site of the volcanic anarchy that bubbles beneath any social organization, thereby announcing the contingency of that order, unquote. Or to translate this into Lumanian language, politics would thus be the difference between the perturbing ability of environmental complexity and the ability of the political system to render that complexity meaningful and productive as an element of its own autopoiesis, which does not, crucially, and this is the connection to Deleuze's control society thesis, avoid or, avoid or repress such conflicts, the conflict, for example, between the disrelation of the role of illegal immigrants as elements of the economic versus the political systems, but rather precisely stages and generates conflicts over such issues within the political and legal domain, <coughs> the better to manage them so that those conflicts do, do not, outside the juridico-political system, go unchecked and run amok. And in so doing, the handling of those conflicts serves an immunitary function for society, as Lumen puts it, by recoding the difference between governing and governed as the internal difference between government and opposition within the political system. <coughs> It's precisely here, I think, it's precisely here, I think, that we find the rather ingenious answer <coughs> to the question raised by both Esposito and Derrida. How does the political system avoid autoimmune disorder if Derrida is indeed right that democracy is suicidal? The answer, according to Lumen, is this reentry of the political system's guiding distinction between governing and governed within the political system itself, what Lumen calls the strategy of the divided top as a means to manage conflict by staging and using conflict, <coughs> a model to which Chantal Mouffe, as you all know, is quite attracted for its foregrounding of the constitutive nature of social antagonism, as is William Roche, who calls it a domestication of the friend-enemy distinction that we find much more gravely and tragically, if you will, in Carl Schmitt. In doing so, <coughs> the political system controls its own autoimmunity by allowing conflicts within the political system between government and opposition to serve the immunitary function of managing, but in a non-representational way, conflicts in the broader society, where Bryant's parts come from. After all, who really thinks that debates in the United States Congress or Senate between Republicans and Democrats actually represent the full social complexity of actually existing society as a whole. Or to put this in the deconstructive terms <coughs> of Michael Nas's gloss, gloss on Derrida's discussion of democracy and autoimmunity, quote, understood as the rule by a demos that cannot, as Aristotle reminds us, rule all at once, democracy must de devise ways for one part of the people to rule and another part to be ruled in turn, in alternation, in rotation, one part followed by another, unquote. <coughs> Excuse me. As Bill Roche summarizes it in his trenchant study, Sovereignty and Its Discontents, with this bifurcation at the top, quote, the governed are both included and excluded from the realm of government. That this exclusion, as necessary and inevitable as it may be, is at times felt to be oppressive, makes it all the more imperative that it, the exclusion not be camouflaged and not be denied." Unquote. In contrast to a view of the properly political that thinks that, quote, one can derive morally correct political institutions from abstract universal norms, unquote, the real challenge takes on a different cast, quote, if we assume that equilibrial difference can only be achieved as a difference of unities, a heterogeneity based on homogeneity, and that, and, and that th then the continuous intellectual challenge <coughs> becomes one of re-entering difference within unity. Hence, he concludes, we must envision political and social structures that freely acknowledge the ordering and civilizing power of antagonism, politics cannot, where politics cannot compensate for the lack of unity, but rather by being its effect guarantees this lack. Decisions, in other words, can reflexively affirm their status as decisions, 
or they can silently deny their own contingency and assume the gesture of logical subsumption. <coughs> for Derrida and Leotard, as for Schmidt, for him anyway, it's the unthought violence of this latter possibility that poses the greatest danger, unquote. Now, <coughs> I'm moving toward my last couple of pages here. I hasten to add here <coughs> that I don't think we need to buy into Rasha's attempt to assimilate Lumen systems theory to Schmidt's position, not least of all because Schmidt's friend-enemy distinction cannot, in my view, survive Derrida's deconstruction of it, any more than Chantal's move, Chantal Mouffe's attempt to assimilate Derrida to Schmidt on the basis of constitutive social antagonism is convincing either for different reasons. And if that's the case, if the friend-enemy distinction doesn't elevate the political system as not just one system among many, but as the most important social system, then we're back to the isomorphism between immunity, ipsaity, self-reference, and autopoiesis being secured not existentially, to use Rasha's phrase, but logically. In which case, as I said before, <coughs> sovereignty is not sovereign because it shares the same logical structure, indeed what Esposito calls the same finitude, and I think that's a good word for it, as all the other social systems. And so, ironically enough, insofar as we're able to secure a proper, that is to say, self-referential and immune definition of the political, we will also unavoidably end up with a concept of the political that is weak. But the political <coughs> is weak and blind in another more important sense that's not limited to its logical status, one that we've already alluded to above in our discussion of the control of control, namely in its inability to overdetermine and steer the autopoiesis of the other social systems, especially, I would add, the economic system. This fact was very much in evidence in the United States in the wake of so-called QE2 and QE3, quantitative easing 2 and 3, and the various political responses to the 2008 economic crisis, and it's very much in evidence now in the United States in the growing realization that quote-unquote getting tough on immigration would in effect economically paralyze cities such as the one where I live, Houston, the fourth largest city in the United States, with a plurality population whose largest fraction is Hispanic. <coughs> As Hans-Georg Muller suggests, on this point, Lumen would appear to be in agreement with economists such as John Gray at the London School of Economics, who holds that the free market policies of the IMF, which have tried to impose scientific and rational steering on complex economic ecologies, have not prevented and perhaps have even exacerbated economic catastrophes in countries such as Russia and Argentina. <coughs> as Gray puts it, quote, this is a great line, I think. As Gray puts it, quote, the idea of modernization to which the IMF adheres is a positivist inheritance. The social engineers who labor to install free markets in every last corner of the globe see themselves as scientific rationalists, but they are actually disciples of a forgotten cult, unquote. Moreover, <coughs> and in more general terms, the political system is weak not only because, as Michael King and Chris Thornhill point out, in the political system, power is in fact divided and communicated between a great number of distinct sites and institutions such as legislators, lobbyists, cabinet ministers, protest groups, civil servants, appointees, and the like, many of which cannot be directly identified with what we would commonly call the state at all. But this weakness, its loose coupling to, to other social systems, you might say, is, strangely enough, in fact, a source of the political system's resilience and durability. As they point out, the vast majority of issues in society, quote, require neither power nor collectively binding decisions, unquote. Problems such as what investments to choose, <coughs> deciding on a course of treatment for an illness, choosing which college to attend, and so on, as they put it, quote, have no directly political content and may be regulated respectively in the systems of economics, medicine, art, or law, unquote. Now, one might object that the political system does indeed intervene in, this system, in these systems in the form of addressing fair access to costly drugs by certain groups of people, let's say, or by taking on corruption or fraud in the financial markets. But as Thornhill and King point out, these interventions actually serve to, quote, elucidate and reinforce the differentiation between one system and another, unquote to make sure that access to drugs is based precisely on medical need alone and not external factors such as race or gender or class, 
and that financial loss or profit is produced by factors of economic performance and not by unfair advantages in the market gained by extra economic means such as insider information. And so, <coughs> they argue, the application of political power, quote, thus has as its most specific function the avoidance or obviation of unnecessary structural coupling, unquote. And what this means, to borrow Derrida's phrase, is that democracy may be suicidal, but society isn't, precisely because society is ecological in the sense that we're using the term. This fact is like most deflationary political talk ever. <coughs> this fact about the political may seem frustrating to some, and indeed is bound to be if you think that the properly political is about eschatology, redemption, authenticity, ontological transformation of the human race, and so on. On the other hand, this weak concept of the political, its inability to unilaterally change what happens in the other social systems, may be frustrating when our people are in power. <coughs> and if you don't believe me, talk to all the people who were enraptured by Obama's election in the United States. But on the other hand, it's quite a relief when their people are in power, which has been the case during most of my adult life, actually. Especially if we think they are crazy. And that's essentially the situation in the United States. <coughs> the situation in the US is half the country thinks the other half of the country is insane, right? Not we support different policies, not we have substantive dis disagreements about uh, matters of legislation, but you and your worldview are crazy, right? That's the situation we have in the States now. And here I think <coughs> we do well to avail ourselves of what thinkers from a range of theoretical and philosophical genealogies have characterized as a comic rather than tragic orientation toward these questions, as in Tim Campbell's exploration and conversation with Esposito's work of what he calls the impolitical comedy of conflict. As Esposito puts it, quote, the impolitical would imply neither a weakening nor a discontinuation of attention to the political, but to the contrary, it's intensification and radicalization, unquote. While the anti-political only confirms the very thing that it resists, the impolitical is a, quote, non-opposition <coughs> that reminds the political of its finitude, unquote. Not from the point of view of something else which is infinite, he continues, but from, from within the very finitude of the terms themselves. For Campbell, the impolitical thus brings us back to conflict, and quote, the difference between the political and the impolitical is thus located in the distinction between conflict that is neutralized in the political and conflict that is composed and which does not move toward an ultimate synthesis in a political order, unquote. The comic orientation then, in his words, <coughs> quoting again, provides the means for acknowledging in lieu of knowing in lieu of the symbolic representation and thus control and capture of conflict. And thus, he continues, the comic figure does not move in terms of a faded order, but offers a space in which previously unthought actions become thinkable." Unquote. As Tim and I <coughs> discussed a couple of years ago when we first shared this work, this orientation bears a striking parallel with what Kenneth Burke writing in the 1940s in the face of the rise of fascism on the one hand and the infatuation of many of his New York intellectual friends with the Communist Party on the other hand, called comic frames of acceptance. While tragedy, to quote Northrop Frye, quote, seems to lead up to an epiphany of law, of that which is and must be, thus leaving us with a sense of the supremacy of impersonal power and the limitations of human effort, unquote, Comedy, for Burke, as John McGowan puts it, quote, is pluralistic and tolerant, accepting, albeit ambivalently, the coexistence of others with whom we disagree. Lacking the comic frame, he continues, the demo shatters into factions and begins to long for a strong authoritarian leader to bring law and order to the chaotic multiplicity of a pluralistic polity, unquote. Which leads us directly, of course, as Esposito points out, to Hitler's famous Telegram 71, <coughs> which is the very apotheosis of autoimmunity run amok. The comic frame is thus not about sovereignty, <coughs> and not about the sacrifice and scapegoating that sovereignty by definition entails to secure its own self-identity and ipsaity. And crucially, it requires of us, quote, an acceptance of nature and of the body 
that does not ask to be redeemed by any beyond, unquote. In characteristically iconoclastic terms, Burke rejects what he calls tragic victimage in favor of what he calls the socialization of losses, unquote. <coughs> Here, I think, we find a strong point of connection between Burke's comic frame and systems theory's articulation of the blind spot of autopoiesis and observation, which allows us to skirt the problems associated with Burke's humanism, namely that adopting comic frames of acceptance can, can readily sound simply like a matter of taking thought and having a better attitude. For Burke, as McGowan puts it, quote, by generalizing guilt, by making us all responsible for the abiding fact of conflict and disagreement, <coughs> by accepting that all of us retain differences that are not fully compatible with the prevailing order, the socialization of losses eschews the fantasy that one great purgative killing could save us from the slings and arrows of our daily interactions, from the inefficiencies of democracy. Where tragedy trains our focus on the individual hero who attains a kind of divinity through serving as the sacrificial victim, comedy replaces the hero with a quote unquote collective body. Here, <coughs> in all its mundanity, I think, is systems theory's point <coughs> that collective guilt, heavy quotes, issues from the fact that all observations are contingent, selective, blind, and bound by the fact of their own self-reference. But with the crucial proviso that for systems theory, and for deconstruction, and for Esposito, and for Foucault, the person and the individual are not constitutive elements of the social system as they are for Burke's humanism. <coughs> does, this, does this blindness Last paragraph. Does this blindness have fatal implications for the comic approach? I think not. Indeed, in a way, it's a condition of its possibility. It may be true, as McGowan puts it, that, quote, comedy of the secular mundane variety requires an acceptance of finitude and a, and a belief in the possible effectiveness of action, unquote. But this need not mean that action and affirmation are simply a matter of taking thought. And that is precisely why we need a radically impersonal theory of the social. <coughs> rather, rather, it means that in a way, it's a matter of doing the impossible, acting on the basis of contingencies, not grounds or foundations. But when viewed in metabiological terms, a, a label that Burke used for his own approach long before Habermas used it on Lumen, when we reconceptualize the collective body of the social in evolutionary and ecological terms, then this blindness isn't what prevents action and affirmation and politicization, it's what makes it possible. Thank you. <coughs> sure, yeah. Sorry about all the coughing, it's like allergy, allergy season. Needless to say, Esposito's talk was a little different <laughs> from, from, the, from that one, yeah. Well, I really didn't think that they Burke You know, I didn't either, actually. Uh, I, did, I, I didn't either, yeah. Well, no. Yeah, well, that, well, that's why I said at the end, I mean, I, I think there's a big project of redescription, you know, that has to happen. Um, you know, the virtue, the virtue of uh, Fry's rendering of tragedy versus comedy, um, which if you go, I actually went back and reread The Anatomy of Criticism a couple years ago, and I was actually blown away by what an amazing book it is. Um, but it's a, I'd forgotten how anthropological, in a way, the book is. But the virtue, the reason I go to Fry very simply is that it helps, it helps pry apart um, the sense of comedy and the sense of funny and ha-ha. And it situates it within a framework that is going to eventually eventuate in, in Derrida's whole critique of sacrificial regimes and something like eating well. And so the point of contact, one of the points of contact here is actually then, uh, strangely enough, and I, I didn't go into this in the paper because it'd be another 10 or 12 pages, but is strangely enough actually with animality and, and, and with, and with quote-unquote animal studies, uh, if you like, because, you know, the oldest 
cliche in the book about comedy is that you know tragedy represents human beings as being higher or greater than they are and comedy represents them as being lower than they are which is to say more animalistic and so part of the turn here is is to say in so many words a, a really profound redescription of pluralism actually doesn't run away from that as something that has to be redeemed but actually embraces that because that that quote unquote animality uh, is, actu is actually the site of a kind of messy, um, non-intentional subject-based set of uh, interactions that are, that are complex and difficult to predict, but that don't need to be purged in the name of some, um, you know, grander notion of, of or, or I should say even more pointedly, sacrificial notion of the political. So um, in Burke, I don't know, Burke is just... Burke is just a weirdo. I mean, you know, if you go back and read Permanence and Change, Counterstatement, Permanence and Change, and Attitudes Toward History, um, these are really strange books. Um, and I don't know, there's a way in which Burke is, is, is no doubt a humanist, but he's a lot weirder than most humanists too, I think. Um, and so I'm try what I'm trying to figure out at the end of the paper is um, how to put together this Burkean sense of, of the comic and comic frames of acceptance with some of this work going on um, uh, in Italian political philosophy that, that Tim is working on, uh, on the comic in relation to the impolitical. And actually animality and the animality of the human also figures pretty centrally in some of that Italian political philosophy work too. But, you're right, it's, 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 it's all stuff that has to be kind of redescribed, and that's where the radically, the radically impersonal theory of the social that you get from Lumen, I think, is, is, really, really, is really crucial. Because it begins with, it begins actually with exclusion, right? And not in a, not in a, not in a kind of a neoliberal sense of that being good or bad, it has a completely neutral valence, and, and Lumen quite readily admits um, some of the globally catastrophic effects of uh, exclusion and functionally differentiated society. Um, but, it's the, but it's the impersonal, it's the, it's the fact that the constitutive elements of social systems are communications and not people um, that for me is the big, is, 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 is one of the big important shifts. Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, I'll try to be quick with this, but uh, you spoke at a few points. You mentioned uh, non-representational, I guess, relations, or I'm not right. even exactly sure what term right. you use. And, um, that's, and that's, that's, that's important, yeah. Okay. The non-representational part is important. Yeah. That's why I'd like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, We're in the same place <laughs> at the same time. All right, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I was wondering if you would, well, speak, speak more about uh, what those are, how we might imagine them, and especially in relation to a few things. Uh, on one hand, I'm thinking about how they could be connected to comedy. Mm -hmm. um, on one hand, how we could think about uh, non-representational relationships as something like a tactic taken on by systems that you define in terms of their weakness. So their weakness in, in terms of the greater complexity of the environment. Um, and I'm also wondering if by non-representational relationships, we're meant to understand something that sort of absolutely excludes what we might consider to be a representational connection. Well, so say more about that last part, I mean, just so I understand. I, I guess I'm just sort of curious whether, um, whether uh, you know, this would fall into a logic of categorization of sort of representational relationships against non-representational relationships that would um, maintain some kind of, like, hard cut or difference between them again. Or we'd have to consider, like, the non-representational quality of these relationships as incorporating like a mutation of representation or contamination of it or something like that. Well, see, I, yeah, okay, I have a better idea of what you're asking now. Um, the first thing I would say is, to me, that's already there in Foucault, right? I mean, Foucault's account of the social and the political is already non-representational. So whenever we're talking about madness, right, we're talking about a non-representational construction that has all kinds of very particular articulations and institutional sites and so on and so forth of this thing that we then link to a set of 
you know, psychochemical manifestations in concrete human beings, right? So to me, to me, Foucault, I mean, one of the things I do in Before the Law, um, you know, is to say, look, you can't, you can't understand factory farming as something that's actually political, not just this embarrassing ethical thing that goes on over here on the sidelines of society that we just try to get everybody to look the other way, but you can't. But to understand it as 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 the, the dispositive of factory farming as as woven into the very fabric of biopolitical society, you have to have a concept of the biopolitical for which not sovereignty is constitutive, but actually apparatuses and dispositifs in the Foucauldian sense are, are constitutive of the problematic, right? And then you and then you can see actually that that, that you know species is actually not even, in some ways, that important <laughs> within how these apparatuses um, operate. So I think that's all, I think the non-representational part is already there in the Foucauldian rendering of, of the biopolitical. Um, I was using it, I was, I was using it more specifically in relation to the immunitary paradigm. And the fact that the immunitary, par the, the, the immunitary mechanism operates non-representationally. Right, so, so the example that I was using um, sort of later in the paper was about how the political system, I mean, the, the key term that links this to Deleuze's discussion of control society is, not, is that conflict isn't something that's avoided. Conflict is something that is actively produced all the time by um, systems like the legal system, and that serves an immunitary function for society, but there's no representational relationship between how the autopoiesis of the legal system produces conflict and the things that it's actually responding to in the broader social environment. So a, a good example that I like to point to is, uh, well, I guess it started with Napster, but then it just became the whole like Pandora's box of, of digital reproduction, right? I mean, in what sense is there a representational relationship between all those technological phenomena and all the modes of social media interaction <coughs> that are enabled by digital reproduction and the use within the US legal system of the entire body of legal precedent built up on the basis of copyright law, <laughs> right? To try to manage and deal with these, these environmental changes, right? So, so, so the, 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 the term that I think links Lumen with Deleuze's account of control society is precisely that, 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 that con conflict becomes a way, but a non-representational way, to, to manage and quote unquote respond to broader conflicts in the environment so that those conflicts do not get completely out of hand and blow up into something else. And even when they do blow, it, blow up into something else, one would have to ask, I think, without taking for granted that you know what you're talking about, to what extent are those blow-ups political or not, right? Um, so, that, so that was the, the immunitary mechanism was, um, was the place that I was focusing on that. Um, but I think that's already there in Foucault. And that's one way in which it, it, it's, it helps make it clearer that I'm actually trying to use Lumen to kind of carry through on some of the Foucaultian articulation of of, of biopolitics. Yeah. Um, so can I ask a bit about um, <coughs> some of the ends or the political areas you find yourself in? Because while you're talking about Lumen, um, it reminded me a little bit of um, some debates in the 90s around his work that he was very celebrated in business theory. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for being sort of this you know, manager of managers. And they love Lacan, too, too, by the way. In business school, yeah, right. <laughs> business schools love Lacan. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I mean, they love a lot of things, but yeah, it includes Lacan. Lacan. Okay. Um, but it, you know, it was this wave of you know World Bank everything, and um, oh yeah, that yeah, this this could do no wrong somehow. Right. We would just kind of manage every crisis from uh, you know just to, to sort of resubsume it back into the system somehow. Right. 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 But this created, obviously, increasing crises elsewhere and so on. Right. So um, at what point, I mean, but it didn't sound like you wanted to go that, you know, to that extent. I mean, it sounded like you were okay with 
a kind of continuous managerial argument. If, if, and just sort of on the theory, theory side, if, if you have a kind of weak, sort of distributed sense of, the, of control, yeah. that, you know, as, as all systems do, they, that becomes a strong, you know, system at, event, at some level, at, at another yeah. point of view. Yeah. So, and so, for example, in, you know, environmentalism, there's, there's arguments that we should constantly control the environment, just regulate it, and yeah. other arguments say, that's, and that's just not workable whatsoever. Either. Yeah, so yeah. Where do you... Well, no, I mean, that's a, that's a, I think, a, a really important question. I mean, the, que the question you're asking, I think, in so many words, is the question of, of Lumen's relationship to neoliberalism. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, you know, that's a really complicated question because, you know, I, I was actually just reading, uh, we did this thing in Australia. I was down there for the month of February, and we did a kind of a one-day event down there of the Society for the Study of Biopolitical Futures, um, and actually a good chunk of it was on liberalism and neoliberalism. So I was going back and rereading, you know, people like Hayek and people like this. And, um, you know, they're, they're, the way I would put it is that there are, way, there are ways in which Lumen, certainly thematically, you might say, overlaps with aspects of neoliberalism. And there are ways in which Lumen is completely antithetical, I think, to neoliberalism, keeping in mind that what that term means is not the same in, uh, you know, Friedman as it is in Hayek, for example. One, one of the things that complicates this, and, and this, this is going to the kind of the subterranean passageways underneath these questions, theoretically speaking, is that if you take an, if you take an evolutionary or ecological account of social complexity or metabiological account of social complexity, um, part of the problem is that and there's, as you know, if you've read a lot of the eco-critical literature going back to classic works like Daniel Worcester's book, The Economy of Nature, a lot of the, fa a lot of the theoretical foundations of present-day ecological thought and evolutionary thought actually overlap like this with basically an economic model, right? And so it raises a very interesting question that's underneath the account that you get in somebody like Hayek, because Hayek's whole neoliberal argument is precisely that the market, you have to let the market do its thing precisely because it's a generative evolutionary site of complex emergence and self-organization that nobody can manage. And so the market, and that's why the market is smarter than anybody else, right? And so, and so there's, a, there's already in, in kind of canonical neoliberal thought, but actually even before that, this kind of heavy co-implication of ecological evolutionary paradigms that will in time become paradigms of self-organization and emergence, right? And economic paradigms of how, of how ecological systems work, right? Um, the difference with Hayek is that Lumen, Lumen does not, I mean, the similarity with Hayek is that Lumen says, look, the idea that the government can control or dictate in, in any, you know, any really predictable way. What goes on in complex economies or financial markets is a fantasy, right? But the difference is that Lumen doesn't say, therefore, the market is going to cure everything and fix everything. The whole theory of functional differentiation is actually about uh, a, dis a mode of, of, of distribution among social systems of which the market is only one, right? And so, and so he's not... I don't think I think I think Lumen's I think Lumen's version of this is actually much more nihilistic <laughs> than what you get in the versions of neoliberalism, including Hayek's, that um, end up wanting to, if only suggestively, ground neoliberalism in some kind of, of rational basis or foundation, and sometimes it's also a moral basis or foundation, right? And that's, that's the point that marks a huge difference with what, with I think, what Lumen's entire architecture is up to, especially once he gets out of the early work, you know, which is, he, which is based on him working with Talcott Parsons, and, mo and, and then makes the turn where he adopts the paradigm of autopoiesis for thinking about social systems, right? So, there, so it's a comp the question you're asking, I think, is a really deep, really deep and complex question that bears upon not only like a Lumanian theory of the political vis-a-vis -vis social complexity, but actually also bears upon the relationship between neoliberalism and eco-criticism.
as well. Yeah. No, that's a that's a that's a huge question. That, that's like a whole. That's, that's like, like a I don't know a couple of books question. You know. Yeah. Another question there. Oh, yeah. Hey, um, yeah, I'm interested in this idea of the metabiological, and I'm not familiar with it. So, um, just wondering um, if I'm right, this is something that you're a way of thinking that you're kind of aligning yourself with in the talk? Or well, the term is the term actually, Kenneth Burke used it back in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. Um, and then Habermas uses it as a stick to beat Lumen with. Yeah. Right. So you're not pro metabiological. Well, I mean, I, for me, the usefulness of the term is to basically point to the fact, and this is actually what I think about this question, is that most of our conceptions of the political, yeah. which in academic circles are actually very much focused on the concept or the idea of the political as, as it has evolved in political philosophy, have a woefully inadequate understanding of, of social complexity vis-a-vis um, -vis the place of what we call the political in this larger type of social complexity. And metabiological or ecological or, or some of these other terms are a good way, I think, to point to whatever, whatever, whatever we're thinking about or talking about, we talk about the political and political effectivity, we need a hell of a lot more complex understanding of the architecture of social systems and organizations before we can talk about what act, you know, what act, how things get taken up and, and what can and can't happen, right? And I'm, part, I'm partly sensitive to this because the way I got into animal studies is I was an animal rights activist. Um, when I was a graduate student, and, uh, and it made me realize that the, the conceptual and rhetorical toolbox that you have to use in different contexts to, to talk to different audiences is really, really different to, to get social change done, right, to, to make it happen. And, and that's okay, right? That's not, to me, something that needs to be redeemed or it's not an act of bad faith. It means you understand in a kind of mafioso way what doing politics is, right? And so, and so it's a way of, that, that's a way of gesturing toward a more complex um, architecture from which there is no Archimedean point to view it and see all of its foibles and see it whole in a way that can somehow be um, dialectically overcome or, or redeemed or, or fixed somehow. So that's, that's the sense in which, um, you know, the good thing about biopolitical thought is biopolitical thought makes you aware, acutely aware, of the dangers <laughs> of recourse to, you know, these ideas of metabiological social organization, which eventuate in the line that runs from Jakob von Uxel up through Agamben's work on the camps in an idea of an organicist idea of the social body Right in relation to which the immunitary mechanism operates in ways that we're familiar with from Agamben's work and, and other and other biopolitical work. So whatever you're talking about, the good thing about biopolitics is it makes you realize whatever it is you're talking about, you, you always have to realize that it cannot be indexed to a zoological or biological, or to put it a little bit finer, racial um, designation. Um, and so that's, and I think that's really something I tried to do in Before the Law, was to say, well, if that's the case, then why does official biopolitical thought always stop at the water's edge of species? You would think, <laughs> you know, we, bio, biopolitics means you can't talk about that without talking about race, but we, but we know at this point, you can't talk about race without talking about species. So and Donna Haraway, you know, points this out with Foucault and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's an important, that, that's why the context here, it's important that the context is the immunity, the beginning context is the immunitary mechanism and is the biopolitical. Um, yeah. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Carrie for a very long time.